one of the most frequent violations of the CLRM is the problem of multicollinearity. If you look at the Gauss Markov theorem's assumption, then the last assumption is that there is no linear relationship between the independent variables. What that basically means is that there is no perfect linear relationship between any of the two independent variables. This is the problem of perfect multicollinearity. Suppose the population regression function was yi equal to alpha plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus sigma i such that x1 is equal to rho times x2 that is there is an exact linear relationship between x1 and x2. Substituting this value of x1 in the original population regression function we get yi equal to alpha plus beta 1 times rho x2 plus beta 2 times x2 plus sigma i. Taking x2 common you get yi equal to alpha plus beta 1 rho plus beta 2 into x2 plus sigma i. Now if you run a regression in the final form that we have shown here, you will get an estimate for alpha and you will get an estimate for beta 1 rho plus beta 2. You can estimate the value of rho by running the regression of x1 on x2 in the functional form of x1 equal to rho into x2 that is without an intercept. However, even if you get the value of rho, there is no way for you to be able to tell what the exact value of beta 1 and beta 2 is. Hence, there is no way that you can estimate independent values of beta 1 and beta 2. Even if you run a regression of y as a function of x1 and x2, we cannot obtain these independent estimates of beta 1 and beta 2. Any statistical software will show up an error and hence when there is perfect multicollinearity, the values of beta 1 and beta 2 cannot be estimated independently. However, in the case of imperfect multicollinearity, for example, let us consider the same population regression function of yi equal to alpha plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus sigma i, such that x1 equal to rho times x2, but this time there is a plus epsilon i, that is there is an error term. This error term would be distributed randomly and hence x1 and x2 will not have an exact linear relationship. Now substituting this value of x1 in the original population regression function, you get yi equal to alpha plus beta 1 epsilon i plus beta 1 into rho plus beta 2 x2 plus sigma i. In this case, we will get an estimate for alpha, we will get an estimate for beta 1 and we will get an estimate for beta 1 rho plus beta 2. However, as mentioned in the previous example, you can obtain an independent estimate of rho by running a regression of x1 on x2. We already have an estimate of beta 1 and hence using both these values of rho and beta 1 in this term, we can find out the value of beta 2. Hence, it is possible to find out independent estimates of beta 1 and beta 2. Thus, when we run y i as a function of x1 and x2, we can find out independent estimates of beta1 and beta2 and hence imperfect multicollinearity will not lead to the same kind of problem as perfect multicollinearity leads to. However, it must be noted that in most economic time series or cross-sectional data, perfect multicollinearity will be very rare. Hence, we will mostly be dealing with imperfect multicollinearity. With that in mind, let us talk about the effects of multicollinearity. The estimates of regression coefficients will still be blue, that is they will be best, linear and unbiased. This is because the Gauss Markov theorem assumes no linear relationships or no perfect linear relationship between different xi's. Since imperfect multicollinearity also does not have any such perfect linear relationships, hence the Gauss Markov theorem is not violated and hence the OLS estimates are best, linear and unbiased. However, the variance of OLS estimators is high, that is their precision is low. The degree to which variance increases in the presence of multicollinearity is given by the variance inflation factor or the VIF. For example, in the previous model, if we consider x1 to be linearly correlated with x2, then when we run the regression of x1 on x2, we obtain a certain r-square value, which is known as the r-square value of the auxiliary regression. The variance inflation factor 
is equal to 1 by 1 minus r2 square wherein r2 square is the r square of the auxiliary regression hence if the r square of the auxiliary regression is high that is if x1 is linearly dependent on x2 to a high extent then the variance inflation factor would also become higher the variance of the slope coefficient b1 is equal to its true variance which is sigma square by summation x1i square wherein x remember is the deviation of x from its mean into the vif hence a high vif would mean that the true population variance is increasing by a factor of the vif note that multicollinearity is a sample phenomenon if repeated samples of the population could be taken, multicollinearity would most probably reduce. Hence, out of the total population, whenever we take a smaller sample, it is more than likely that some of those samples would be correlated and hence multicollinearity can best be treated by taking larger samples. So once we have agreed that multicollinearity leads to greater variance, then we can make a statement about what would happen to the hypothesis test. For example, let us consider a slope coefficient beta 1 which is normally distributed around the mean of x. Suppose x prime and x double prime are the two critical values on either side of x. When we say that a problem of multicollinearity exists, we are saying that we will have greater variance. That is, the normal distribution will now have fatter tails. In such a case, the area beyond x prime and x double prime increases. Hence, x prime and x double prime to maintain the same level of significance have to be shifted further, which means that the critical region becomes farther away from the mean, and hence we are less likely to reject the null hypothesis. Hence, when we have the problem of multicollinearity, we see that the significance level of the individual slope coefficients usually goes down. However, because we have added more variables than are ideally necessary, the r square value goes up as it always does if you add extra variables. Hence the typical effect of multicollinearity is to cause the r square to go up while the individual slope coefficients become less significant that is the t values come down. Hence a high r square and a low t value is the perfect recipe for multicollinearity. To detect multicollinearity thus the first thumb rule is a high overall r square but few significant t ratios for estimates of beta i's. Second would be a high correlation between x i's. However, this correlation might not only be driven by the relationship between these two x's but between these two x's and another variable which might be z. Hence we talk about partial correlation which is the correlation between two x i's holding other x i's constant. However, the best way to detect multicollinearity would be by running a subsidiary or an auxiliary regression. As we have previously talked about, it is a regression in which one of the x's, say x1, is regressed on the other x's, say x2, x3, all the way till xn. Once we run this regression, we obtain an r-square value. We thus test for the significance of this r-square value by doing an f-test. The F test is run using the formula r square by k minus 1 into 1 minus r square by n minus k, where is n in the sample size and k is the number of parameters. If this r square turns out to be significantly different from 0, we will say that x1 is linearly dependent on the other x's and hence we have a problem of multicollinearity. The last method is the variance inflation factor method which we have talked about previously. The variance inflation factor is given by 1 by 1 minus r2 square wherein r square is the r square value of the auxiliary regression. Usually a high value of variance inflation factor would be something from 6 to 10. However, there is a bit of judgment that the, in, the person has to use whether the variance inflation factor is high or low. The remedies of multicollinearity, firstly dropping a variable. However, dropping a variable has the problem that it might lead to model misspecification and hence biased estimates for other variables. If you look at the module on model specification, you will see that under fitting of a model, that is dropping a relevant variable, is any day worse than 
putting an extra variable which will cause multicollinearity. Hence, if you drop a variable which has a low t value, you might be committing the problem of underfitting the model. The second remedy and the simpler one is to increase the sample size. As we have said previously, the variance of beta 1 equals the true variance of beta 1 into the variance inflation factor. A larger sample size, that is a sample in which we have a larger number of po data points, will increase the summation of x1i square. x1i equals xi minus mean of xi. Hence, if you have more xi's and since this is a squared number, it can never be negative. Hence, as you increase the sample size, summation x1i square will go up and hence the variance of beta 1 comes down. The third method is to change the model. Firstly, a different functional form such as log linear or lin log might lead to lower collinearity between xi's. Secondly, a value of one of the bi's may be known beforehand. For example, in the previous population regression function that we talked about, if we know the value of beta 2 previously, we can just put that value of beta 2 and then our regression becomes one of y i minus beta 2 x 2 regressed on beta 1 x 1. This takes care of the problem of multicollinearity because now there is no multicollinearity between x1 and x2 because x2 is no more an independent variable. Thirdly, variables can be transformed either to per capita or in real terms. Once you do this, then the problem of multicollinearity which might have been because you were multiplying a number either by a price factor or by a population factor will not be a problem. To conclude our study of multicollinearity, it must be stated that multicollinearity will always exist between any two independent variables and hence multicollinearity is a problem of degree and not of existence. More importantly, multicollinearity might not always even be a problem. If the objective of the study is to make predictions, then multicollinearity will lead to a higher R square and hence is better for making predictions. However, if the purpose of the study is to study the impact of individual xi's on the yi, then multicollinearity will lead to erroneous results. Hence, whoever is conducting the study must take a call on what level of multicollinearity he is able to tolerate. This brings to an end our study of multicollinearity.